That was our last argument, after Patricia was served the papers but before we went to court. We both pretended, playing roles for each other. I pretended that I still wanted to talk things over, though the coffin lid on our marriage had slammed shut the moment the private investigator showed me the photo of her kissing Bradley Jacobson. By the fifth minute of the first video recording, our marriage was already buried, and I was shoveling dirt on its grave. As for Patricia, I don't know exactly what she was pretending. Maybe she thought her ongoing infidelity was still a topic worth discussing. Maybe she believed we could somehow come to a reasonable agreement to stay married while she kept sleeping with Bradley on the side. My wife, Patricia Wilson, May Anderson, is a lawyer. Bradley is actually one of her assistants, and finding ways to be reasonable in completely unreasonable situations is what she does for a living. At home, I suppose she does it on a voluntary basis, the phrase, Matt, be reasonable, was a constant refrain throughout most of our 25-year marriage. But after I served her the papers, she added a new phrase to her repertoire, fragile male ego. As in, Matt, this isn't about me or who I am or am not sleeping with. It's about your fragile male ego. God, how I hate that phrase. And, of course, we didn't delve too deeply into that last discussion before she decided to drop it. Matt, if you could see beyond your fragile male ego, you'd understand that this isn't a threat to you at all. She gave me her most reassuring, most reasonable, smile. I don't love him, and in a few months, we'll both move on. You and I can still ride off into the sunset together. I have to give Patricia credit, she's very bold. As she said this, she was absentmindedly running her fingers along the stem of her favorite glass of unnoked Australian Chardonnay, sitting next to a manila folder on our kitchen table. In the folder, of course, was my divorce filing, along with several of the most incriminating photos the private investigator managed to take. In other words, the Titanic has hit the iceberg, the orchestra is playing nearer, my God, to thee, and the women and children are being led to the lifeboats. Meanwhile, Patricia is saying that if I'm reasonable, if I can just get past my fragile male ego, we might still make it to port. The thing is, Patricia thinks we're still negotiating, but I'm no longer interested in resolving anything. I want the conversation to end. Patricia, let's pause for a second, I said, cutting her off mid-sentence. You keep talking about my fragile male ego, saying that if I can get past it, we'll be fine. What exactly do you mean by fragile male ego? She frowned for a moment, a little offended at being interrupted. Well, it's very simple, Matt. You're afraid of competition. You're afraid that, somehow, you won't measure up. She smiled at me again, gently, with a touch of condescension. But darling, you don't need to worry. You're my guy. My man. And what about Bradley, then? She blushed. Bradley, well, Bradley is just a toy. Like a workout machine. I'm not planning to replace you or stop loving you. You have nothing to worry about. I gave her a slightly frowning, slightly bewildered look, the kind husbands use when they want their wives to feel superior, usually so we can get away with something. So, just to be clear, you think I'm worried that you're going to stop loving me or replace me with a younger model? She nodded, her gentle smile widening. And you think that makes me a little vulnerable? That I need reassurance? Exactly. And, darling, you have nothing to worry about. I spoke slowly, as if I were trying to piece it all together. And somehow this vulnerability is tied to the fact that I'm a man. She patted my arm. Gently. Condescendingly. Oh, dear, it's not just you. All men have fragile egos. Her smile broadened. Part of what we, as wives, do is support our men, keep your confidence up. I wanted to yell at her, to ask how, in God's name, sleeping with a 25-year-old was supposed to support me, but I knew that would only make her dig her heels in. I wasn't surprised Patricia bought into all that pop psychology nonsense about women being stronger than men, we'd been dancing around that crap for years. 
But I was tired, we were almost at the end, and I was done dancing. You know, Patricia, you've been using that phrase for a long time, I said, staring her down. I've been letting it slide, one thing I've learned after 25 years with you is to pick my battles. But if there's anything I want to leave you with today, it's the understanding of how completely ridiculous this whole argument is. She started to object, but I continued. The reason people focus on the fragile male ego is because it seems abnormal. It's like in those videos, how many times have you seen a guy get hit where it hurts the most? She nodded. She was about to let me go with that for a while before pulling me back in. Plenty. Yes. It's funny, at least, to women, because men always seem so strong, and this one thing is enough to make most of them fall down and vomit. Suddenly, the big, strong, scary man curls up into a ball, gasping for air. You get what I mean. Yes, but... But watching a woman in the same situation isn't funny, is it? She nodded. But why not? If one person doubling over in pain is funny, why not the other? Because that's violence. A man hitting a woman, that's violence. And a woman hitting a man isn't. I shook my head. Never mind, we're getting off topic. The point is that watching a woman writhing in pain isn't funny because we're taught to see women as fragile and weak, so the idea of making a woman cry isn't strange or particularly humorous. I don't understand where you're going with this. I took a deep breath. The point is, it's the same with the ego. When I go to work every day, my friends, my friends, joke about my sexual abilities, my size, my belly, my thinning hair, and anything else they can find to tease me about. Now imagine if your friends did the same to you. Imagine walking into the office and immediately getting comments on every area that you feel insecure about. How would that make you feel? God, she said, I can't imagine a woman ever treating her friend like that. And certainly not all the time. But that's exactly what happens with us, the big, strong men. We shrug it off, throw back a comment, and get on with our day. Now, I was the one patting her arm. Gently. Condescendingly. I wondered if she noticed. The truth is, the only place I allow myself to feel fragile and vulnerable is in this home. This is where I take off the armor, show my soft underbelly, and trust that you won't take advantage of it. What you see as my fragile male ego is just me letting my guard down in the only place in the world where I feel I can be fragile. Do you understand? Patricia smiled and nodded. I could see her gathering her strength for another attack. But that's exactly the point, Matt. Here, you're safe. You can be vulnerable. I'm not going to leave or throw away what we have because of, because of a fling. I took off my glasses and rubbed the bridge of my nose. You still don't get it, Patricia. I believed you when you told me I was the best lover in the world, even though I knew, objectively, that wasn't true. Hell, in the last 25 years, I've only had one lover, not exactly a lot of experience. I smiled. I believed you when you said that I was enough for you, that my size was perfect for you, that my body still excited you. I took you at your word, even when I knew you were just boosting my ego. I chose to be vulnerable with you because I thought I could trust you. I'm so glad that you. And you betrayed that. I shouted, slamming my hand on the table. Her eyes widened, and she fell silent. I took a deep breath and tried to regain my calm voice. About six months ago, I started noticing that you weren't being so careful with my vulnerability. I noticed the way you spoke when I took off my shirt, how you closed your eyes when we had sex. I picked up on the snide comments about needing to hit the gym or give up beer. She looked at me, stunned, and I continued. I noticed that you stopped telling me about your day or asking about mine. I noticed that you weren't around me anymore. Even before you started sleeping with Bradley, I realized you were no longer a safe space for me. You weren't going to protect my vulnerability. Matt, I, she paused. 
was the lawyer at a loss for words. I looked her in the eyes. Firmly. Her eyes were shining, and I'm sure mine were too. I tried to fight it, Patricia. I asked you out to dinner more often, complimented your clothes. I tried to plan more vacations, more time just for us. I tried to show you that you were special to me. I dressed better. I started going to the gym. I hoped you'd remember how special I once was to you. I looked down at my hands. Not now. I couldn't let her see the tears. I couldn't be vulnerable anymore. Enough. It didn't work. You found reasons to cancel dinners, reasons why we couldn't go on vacation. When I complimented your clothes, I could see you worrying whether I noticed you were dressing for him. And when I sent flowers to your office, I never got a response. I looked up at her. Later, when you started picking fights just to avoid having sex with me, I knew I had failed. You forgot that I was special, and you were already on your way to no longer being special to me. I never picked fights to avoid sex. I groaned. Seriously? That's her takeaway. Patricia, can you just be honest? At least with yourself, if not with me. You've been pushing me away for six months. She glanced up at me for a second, then dropped her gaze back to her hands. Charming hands. I shrugged. Anyway, yes, back then my ego was fragile. I spent a lot of time in the office with the door closed, mourning our relationship. I tried to put on a strong face, the one I wear at work, so you wouldn't see how deeply you hurt me. I started finding reasons to leave the house, to avoid spending time with someone who could hurt me, and who now so clearly wanted to. She looked shocked. I smiled slightly and gently patted her hand again. But you'll be glad to know that my fragile ego has healed. I found other things to occupy my time, and other people who made me feel special. She looked up, a question in her eyes. I smirked. No, I didn't cheat on you, but I did notice that some of the women at the gym didn't seem all that turned off by my body these days. Anyway, by the time I had proof and was talking to a lawyer, you wouldn't have even known that my fragile male ego had ever been hurt. Are we done? I thought we were. After all, I had said what I needed to, and I thought maybe she had finally heard me. Maybe now we could move on. But, of course, I was married to a lawyer, and there was no such thing as a lost case. But Matt, there was never any need for this, she yelled. Yes, I admit I've been, distracted lately, but I never stopped loving you. In my world, you were always number one. I'm sorry I didn't see how fragile you were, how much I hurt you. Patricia kept talking, kept weaving beautiful pictures with her words, but I wasn't listening. That word again. Fragile. She still didn't get it, and I realized she probably never would. I wasn't trying to be nice anymore. Patricia, stop, I snapped. I think she could hear the anger in my voice, though I tried to hide it. I took a long, slow breath. Exhaled. You still don't get it, do you? You still think this is all about my fragility, my fragile male ego, right? Honey, there's nothing shameful about it. All men. All people, Patricia. We all have fragile egos. And we trust those we care about to protect them. Well, yes, of course, but men are especially fragile. I mean. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I leaned in toward her, as if I were about to confide something. I tried my hardest to keep the sarcasm at bay, but she wasn't making it easy. Patricia, I've spent most of the last 25 years trying to figure out how to be honest with you without hurting your ego. When you'd ask me if that lipstick suited you or if that dress made you look fat, I had to find an answer that wouldn't hurt your feelings, but also wouldn't let you leave the house looking like a crazed clown or an overstuffed sausage. Patricia blushed, her eyes widening. She wasn't used to this kind of honesty. Suddenly, I realized I found it funny. Patricia, when I say things like, Honey, I'm not sure that lipstick goes with that blouse, or, Wow, 
could you change? I'm not comfortable with our neighbors drooling over your chest all night, I was giving you an out. I pretended I wasn't sure of my words or that my fragile male ego was at risk. And do you know why I did that? She shook her head. It's because I didn't want to put your ego at risk. That's, that's nonsense. Patricia fumed. I can remember several times when you were pretty clear about something not looking good. I smirked. Oh, I admit, I messed up from time to time, I said. I think we both remember what happened when I commented on your eyeshadow looking like that of an adulteress. Or when I said, yes, that dress does make your butt look big. Those big, hurt eyes. The cold, thanks for your honesty, and a week or two of freezing temperatures in the bedroom. I quickly realized that honesty is definitely overrated and it comes to giving my wife my opinion. So, you've been lying to me for 25 years? Patricia looked like she was ready to explode. It was time to wrap this up. Let's just say I gave you a selective and carefully edited version of the truth. I told you that you were the most beautiful woman in the world. That your trips to the gym took a decade off your age. That even Venus de Milo couldn't compare to your backside. I gave you extravagant compliments, just like the ones you gave me, to show you how I see you, and, in the process, to boost your fragile ego. My ego isn't fragile. Patricia, you have a fat ass. She looked at me as if I had just punched her in the chest. What? I smiled at her. You have stretch marks. Your breasts have sagged. Your hair roots are graying, and your teeth are yellowing. Those expensive creams you buy don't hide the wrinkles on your face or your double chin. Darling, it's time to think about aging gracefully because fighting it isn't working anymore. She gasped, her eyes widened. A few blows, and they all hit the mark. Lord Jesus, Matt. Patricia, remember the feeling you're experiencing right now. Think about it. Now imagine I told you I was sleeping with some pretty young thing at the office. Someone 10 or 20 years younger than you, with a firm butt and full breasts. She's trying all her tricks on me because our relationship is still new, and she's just getting started with her game. Imagine I come home to you after being with her a couple of times a week. How's your ego doing? Feeling a bit fragile? Patricia looked a little pale. I, yes, she murmured. That's what you never understood, Patricia. I'm not blind. You're not the most beautiful woman in the world. Hell, I could probably walk out the front door and find half a dozen women in our neighborhood who are objectively more attractive than you. I looked at her again, but her head was still bowed. I could see the tears on her cheeks. You're not the most beautiful, not the smartest, and not the funniest. But to me, you were all of those things. You were the most beautiful, the funniest. The best. When I saw all your flaws, I also saw the life we lived together. Your breasts sagged because you used them to feed our children. You have a big backside because you carried them in your body. You have laugh lines because we laugh together. I looked at the road map of your body and saw the miles we traveled together. I cherished every one of those miles and the marks they left. She looked up, and it was like the final scene of a boxing movie, the one that happens just before the knockout. She sobbed. And now? What do you see now? Lord, I thought, she's practically asking for it. It would be so easy. Part of me, hell, most of me, wanted to deliver that knockout blow, the one that would leave her so broken that she'd spend the next few years bouncing from bed to bed, trying to prove she still got it. And there she was, chin up, just waiting for it to drop. But that's the thing. It's not about delivering the knockout blow anymore. In truth, it's not even about Patricia. She looked in the mirror, saw time passing, and decided she could find the fountain of youth in the body of a younger man. And then, when she got caught, she tried to stand tall, throwing out challenges and clever words. I think we both know now that she's weak, small, and will be left alone. 
As for me, I had already cried my tears in the car, behind the door of my office, in a park a mile from my house. I spent months hiding my pain from my wife while I fought and then mourned the death of my marriage. Now, I had to plan the rest of my life. The first step was to ask myself what I wanted to see in the mirror every morning. A guy who took a cheap shot. A guy who won some pointless competition with a weak woman who wrecked her own life. A bully? No. I wanted to see what I saw now, a merciful man. A good man. An honest man. I took another deep breath and placed my hand over Patricia's once more. What do I see now? Now, I see a woman with whom I spent some of the best years of my life. I see someone I trusted with my vulnerability until I couldn't trust her anymore. I squeezed her hand. I see someone I will truly miss. She stood up, forcing a smile. It was crooked, and it didn't help hide the tears. It doesn't have to be this way, she said. We can find our way back. No, we can't, I sighed. You're right about one thing, Patricia. I'm not fragile, but my trust was. I'll never be able to take off my armor again. I'll never be able to let you in. Maybe we could live together. Sleep in the same bed, go on vacations, make some memories. But the truth is, I'll always be watching you. Wondering if you're judging my body. Wondering if you're comparing me in bed to someone else. Wondering if you're staying because you love me or just out of habit. That's not true. I'm not going to live like that, Patricia. I think I've got another 30 or 40 years ahead of me, and I don't want to spend them with someone I don't trust, pretending to feel safe and secure when I don't. I don't deserve that. And honestly, if you really love me, you wouldn't ask me to go through that. For all her legal skills, Patricia is pretty transparent, at least to me. I could see in her eyes that she was trying on counterarguments, testing them, seeing which ones might work. And then I saw the moment she realized it was truly over. The light in her eyes seemed to fade. Once Patricia decided not to fight, the divorce went quickly. We traded jewelry for tools and a TV, furniture for my partially restored Mustang. In the end, we sold the house, split everything evenly, and saved a lot of money on lawyers. The thing about divorce is that even when it's over, it's not really the end. I still see Patricia often, at our kids' birthdays, anniversaries, Christmases. Sometimes she brings a date, and I usually have a woman by my side. For the past year or so, it's been the same woman, and from the look in Patricia's eyes, I can tell she knows what that means. I try not to gloat, but sometimes my ego, well, it can be a little fragile.